Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live presentation of the National Home Infusion Foundation's 2020 Outstanding Abstract Achievement Award. I'm Jen Sharon, NHIA's Chief Operating Officer and your moderator for today's exciting presentation. The Outstanding Abstract Achievement Award was first, first awarded in 2019 and is presented to an individual who lead authors a research poster at our annual conference. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent cancellation of our 2020 annual conference, we still wanted to recognize the amazing work our, po our poster authors did to advance the practice of home and specialty infusion through research and innovation. This year, we had over 20 posters. In the coming weeks, we will produce PDF versions of all of our posters, which will be available on the NHIF website for your reference. Let's take a minute to review the process for awarding the Outstanding Abstract Achievement Award on today's webinar. Each author will present their research. Our international finalists from Australia will be presenting via recorded video due to the time difference. Once all the finalists have presented, we will move to a Q&A session while our, our esteemed judges, Danelle Haynes, David Grady, Connie Sullivan, Chris Maxim, and John Rademacher make the final determination of our 2020 winner. Okay, just a couple of housekeeping reminders. You can submit questions at any time via the question tab in the navigation pane. You can also access the slides via the handout section of the navigation pane. And finally, the session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to all registrants approximately an hour after the presentation. In addition, this session does include CE. To, retreat, to receive CE for the live presentation, follow the appropriate link in the follow-up email to complete a short quiz within 24 hours. For any questions regarding CE, please contact Jen Lyons. Okay, let's get started. We're first going to start our presentation with Janet Sluggett, our international from Australia presentation. Hi everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. So my name is Janet Sluggett and I work at a home infusion pharmacy called CPI Pharmacy Services. We're based here in Adelaide, which is in the southern part of Australia, and here are some of the member, members of our team. And um, We have a community pharmacy and a hospital pharmacy as well. So I just wanted to start by declaring the following interest. So this project was actually part of a collaboration um, funded by the South Australian Government um, to um, enable industry to collaborate more with universities. So as part of this study, CPI Pharmacy Services, our pharmacy organisation, provided in-kind support for the study, but all of the experiments and um, data analysis were performed by our co-investigators at Flinders University. And I also just wanted to mention um, myself and Andrew are both shareholders in Infusion Innovations, um, which is a recently established company which is looking to commercialise an electronic infusion device. So by way of background, in Australia, the home infusion space is a little bit different to the US. In Australia, we predominantly see IV antibiotics given in the home. They may be given as a bolus or a very short five to 15 minute infusion, but much more frequently we're seeing 24 hour continuous infusions of the, in the home. So we're seeing things like um, Kefazol and flucoxacillin and vancomycin given 24 hours a day. A nurse will come to the person's home usually, um, change over the infusion pump or bag, um, provide catheter care and um, do a quick check of the patient before moving on. So I guess because we have such long infusion periods in the home here in Australia, over the last few years our pharmacy organisation has been undertaking more and more research in this area. And one area that we've been particularly interested in is the impact of changes in pressure or height differences when somebody is wearing an infusion device and whether that could impact on pump performance. Several previous studies have looked at um, the influence of changes in pressure that can occur when somebody is in an aeroplane flying um, or when there's been partial filling of an elastomeric device. Um, but there's been very few um, studies which have looked at other types of back pressures and the influences on pumps. And we know that this can vary with different patients and potentially during the day. So for instance, there can be differences in kick lines that are used, differences in connectors, um, there can be partially occluded lines. All of these factors could exert a different back pressure 
um, which could vary among patients and potentially impact on pump performance. Another factor that can influence um, on um, back pressure or resistance is the height at which the pump is carried. So we're always counselling our patients to um, try and keep the um, infusion pump at the same height as the infusion device. But during a 24 hour continuous infusion at home, sometimes that can be a little bit challenging for patients to manage. Um, and we know that from a small number of studies, potentially changing the height of the device at which it's carried could impact on um, infusion performance. So the aim, overall aim of this piece of work was to look at how varying pump height and back pressure could change infusion, infusion flow rate or the volume delivered from a device. So for this study, we conducted a series of simulated infusions. Um, we used four elastomeric devices shown here and one electronic device, which is shown on the right. So we had the Baxter LV10, the Leventon Dose Fuser, the Nipro Shore Fuser and the B Braun Easy Pump. So the first three were designed to infuse over 24 hours. The B Braun Easy Pump is marketed to infuse over 27 and we programmed the end of continuous to infuse over 24 hours. So in terms of flow rates, um, they're all around 10 to 10.4 mils per hour flow rate. Um, the elastomeric pumps are generally marketed to have a flow rate accuracy of between 10 to 15%. Um, whereas the AMBIT continuous is marketed at plus or minus six percent. So we conducted a series of simulated infusions in the lab under standard testing conditions for ambulatory infusion devices and we determined the outcomes using gravimetric analysis which basically involves measuring changes in the weight of the infusion solution over time. So we looked at a variety of key outcomes um, as part of this study, but I'm just going to present two main ones today, and that is the infusion flow profile for each device, and also the percentage of total volume that was delivered over 24 hours or 27 hours for the easy pump. So on this slide, we have a diagram which shows um, the experiment set up. I'll just quickly run through this with you. So each pump was placed on a scale, um, and the line from the pump with the restrictor, which is usually taped to a patient's skin, was held in a temperature chamber at 90 degrees Fahrenheit and connected to the end of an 18 gauge pick line. The end of the pick line was connected to a water column and this was used to simulate a back pressure on the device during testing and it was also then connected to a pressure sensor to test that pressure. Um, for all of the experiments we first ran um, the experiments where the pump was held at the same height as the um, pick line and the water column um, and then we ran a series of experiments where we varied um, the back pressure, so between zero and 30 millimetres of mercury, or we varied the height of the scales on the pump, so we increased it or decreased it by 20 to 40 centimetres. Each experiment was run five times, um, and there were 10 different height or back pressure combinations. So overall, each brand of pump was tested 50 times, and we used a new electro uh, elastomeric device each time and the same electronic pump for the tests. So this is the results when we look at the infusion flow profiles. Um, so as I said, each of the devices were designed to run over 24 hours or 27 for the easy pump. But in this particular test, we let the device run to empty. So I'll just walk you through it. So on the y-axis, we have the percentage of the flow rate that was specified by the manufacturer. So they were 10 to 10.4 mils per hour generally. On the y-axis, we have the duration of the infusion. So we can see um, for the first four pumps that are the um, elastomeric pumps, they're often characterised, the flow is characterised by a peak at the start of the infusion. Um, they're all generally peaking at around 100% or above. You'll see that the blue one, the easy pump, is actually peaking um, the flow rate over the first couple of hours is um, almost two and a half times that which is specified by the manufacturer. And then towards the end of the infusion, it gradually tapers off. Whereas a couple of the elastomeric pumps, so the Baxter and the Shaw fuser in the red and the purple, have a slight peak at the end, whereas the Dothy fuser um, and the um, easy pump, as I said, taper off towards the end. In contrast, the amber pump is relatively continuous flow rate throughout um, the infusion. There were very few rapid infusions so um, that finished before the 24 hour period. The majority of infusions actually took um, longer than the 24 hour period. So there are a small number of dose if user, short fuser and easy pump um, infusions that took almost 60 hours to empty and two short fuses took nearly 80 hours. So obviously um, mostly prolonged infusions and these are the um, average rates that are shown in this diagram. 
But overall, when the height and back pressure was kept at zero, um, the pumps, pumps were generally operating within the manufacturer specifications. So within the 10 to 15% for the elastomerics and the plus or minus 6% for the continuous device. But when we started to vary the height at which the pump was um, situated or the back pressure on the pump, um, we started to see some variation. So there was a little bit of variation in the Baxter pump, um, but not so much as the other elastomeric pumps. So, but you can see with the other elastomerics, the dose diffuser, the easy pump and short fuser, as we change the height or the back pressure, there's definitely a variation in the percentage of volume that is delivered. Whereas for the AMB um, continuous electronic device, there was a relatively um, constant amount of volume delivered um, despite the changes in those parameters. So I guess overall, um, the flow rates and, and volume delivered were um, within the specified um, operate uh, specifications for the elastomeric and the electronic device when there was no height or back pressure difference. But there was variation with the elastomeric pumps when we varied those parameters. Um, and the impact of the and clinical significance of those might vary depending on the drug that you're um, infusing and the, and the patient. So, um, so, for example, if you have a drug with a narrow therapeutic index or that has a short half-life, you may want a more consistent flow rate. And so there may be some pumps that are preferred for 24-hour infusions of those medications compared to others. But I think overall the results show that um, there are further studies that um, should examine what volume is actually delivered to patients in real-world settings. In terms of the study limitations, um, we did a simulated, simulated infusion. Um, it wasn't administered to an actual patient. We only tested one electronic device um, and there was a consistent ambient temperature throughout the experiment. And we know that in practice in the home that um, ambient temperatures can vary and impact on pump performance. But overall, our findings suggest that I think that um, it's important to understand the practical limitations and also the advantages of each different type of device. Even if it's um, an elastomeric device, different devices within that class can still vary in their infusion flow profiles. Um, and again, keep counselling patients to um, carry that um, pump at the same height as the infusion site where possible. So I'd just like to acknowledge our co-authors um, and mention that this paper has been published and the wider results from the study are available. So um, please check out our paper if you're interested or feel free to contact me if you'd like to know more information. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm sorry I can't be there live and hope to see you at the conference next year. Bye everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much. So next up, we have Shelby, as Ryan will be um, pulling up our slides here. And uh, Shelby, uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you. My name is Shelby Dick, and I am the current resident at the Lincoln, Nebraska Option Care Health location. Today, I will, will be providing a review of my project titled Pharmacist Focused Vancomycin Dosing Competency Program, concentrating on dosing strategies to reduce adverse events. Next slide, please. In March 2020, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists released the updated consensus guidelines for monitoring and dosing vancomycin. In order to provide some background, I will review the differences and recommendations between the two. The previous 2009 consensus guidelines support an AUC of at least 400 for the optimal bacterial killing for the treatment against Staphylococcus aureus, and they recommend the measurement of a serum trough level with a goal of 15 to 20 serving as a surrogate marker for a probable AUC to MIC ratio of 400. It has become evident that the use of trough-based dosing strategies have led to increased rates of nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity due to excessive drug exposure. In one meta-analysis completed in 2013, it was found that trough levels approaching greater than 15 had a greater risk for nephrotoxicity. The authors of this meta-analysis strongly support a relationship between trough levels, vancomycin duration, and nephrotoxicity. The 2020 update to the consensus guidelines have changed to support measuring an AUC directly rather than using a trough as a surrogate marker. The AUC is a measure of total cumulative drug exposure over time, whereas the previously supported trough measurement provides a serum drug level at one particular time only. The goal of an AUC to MIC ratio of 400 to 600 um, is recommended to reduce overall drug exposure 
and is therefore predicted to limit toxic seed. Next slide, please. Pharmacists have not routine, routinely received extensive training on AUC-based dosing strategies since the previous guidelines supported trough-based dosing strategies. A competency program is essential to prepare pharmacists for the implementation of AUC dosing into their clinical practice setting. And it is hypothesized that completing the educational program will set a standard for vancomycin knowledge between all pharmacists by providing a thorough review of traditional and AUC-based dosing strategies along with increasing pharmacist confidence in the AUC to MIC ratio dosing strategy. Next slide, please. This project involved a pre-competency program survey, a 30-minute presentation, and a post-competency program survey. The competency program was rolled out to eight pilot sites and pharmacists were given three months to complete the entire program. Next, please. The pre-competency survey uh, completion was required prior to watching the competency presentation. The pre-competency survey contained 11 total questions and included demographic questions to assess how long the pharmacist had been licensed and how long they had been practicing in the home infusion setting. This part of the survey also contained question to, questions to assess baseline usage of AUC to MIC dosing in clinical practice and had questions regarding confidence in using both trough and AUC-based dosing. Confidence using trough and AUC-based dosing was um, assessed using a ranking scale of one to 10, with a score of 10 being very comfortable or very confident, and a score of one being not comfortable and not confident. Next, please. Now we will discuss the presentation portion of the competency program. Next, please. The presentation included background information on trough and AUC-based dosing, along with clinical pearls and strategies for using each. The presentation also contains a tutorial on how to use basic online pharmacokinetic calculators to analyze trough and AUC-based dosing using, using patient-specific information. Next, please. And then finally, we will move on to the post-competency survey. The post-competency survey contains 16 total questions and integrated patient cases to facilitate the use of pharmacokinetic calculators to simulate routine clinical practice using AUC-based dosing strategies. The post-competency survey contained the same self-declared confidence questions from the pre-competency survey, and the overall results between the two were compared to assess for an increase in self-declared confidence. The purpose of the post-competency survey was to evaluate knowledge retained upon completion of the program. Next, please. Questions on the pre- and post-competency surveys were categorized into seven different competency objectives that were used to assess baseline understanding of the two dosing strategies and will also serve as a surrogate marker for assessment of knowledge gained following completion of the entire program. The first competency objective is assessing appropriateness um, of the vancomycin therapy and for the use of AUC-based dosing. Two is the ability to use valid tools, which would assess the pharmacist's ability to use the recommended online dosing calculators. Three is recommending appropriate dose adjustments. Four is creating an appropriate monitoring strategy, focusing mainly on AUC-based monitoring strategies. Five is patient-specific pharmacokinetic calculations, which would assess the pharmacist's ability to effectively use patient-specific demographics to come with, up with a patient-specific dosing strategy. Six is understanding basic drug properties of vancomycin. And seven was the self-declared confidence questions for using both trough and AUC-based dosing strategies. The seven competency objectives were chosen based on the importance in understanding vancomycin drug information the different strategies related to dosing, and the development of monitoring plans. A pharmacist should be fluent in each of the categories in order to feel confident in their clinical skills to practice accurately and efficiently. Overall percentage scores for each competency objective were compared to assess for improvement from baseline knowledge. Next, please. Uh, this graph shows the results from the demographic questions in the pre-competency survey. Um, and we found that a majority of pharmacists have been practicing for at least 10 years, and that was 59.3% of the pharmacists. 
Um, and 57.6% of pharmacists have only been in the home infusion pharmacy setting for five years or less. This information brings up an important concept relating to vancomycin dosing in the home setting. Many of these pharmacists likely had varying pharmacy experience prior to practicing in the home infusion setting. And this could mean that they may not have had regular practice with outpatient dosing of vancomycin. This also reinforces the idea that pharmacists often have varying strategies for dosing vancomycin and the variation could be based on their previous practice history. This idea reinforces the importance of standardizing knowledge throughout an enterprise so that optimal and consistent patient outcomes can be reached. Next, please. This uh, next chart shows scores for both the pre and post competency objectives um, and the differences in scores between the uh, post survey and pre survey. And what we found were that scores increased for each competency objective between the pre and post survey with the highest increase in score for the assessing appropriateness category, which had a 56.2% increase in score. The ability to use valid tools category had the lowest increase in score with an increase of only 8.1%. This is likely due to the lack of integration of AUC dosing into daily practice. And as AUC dosing becomes more prevalent in practice, pharmacists will gain more experience using the pharmacokinetic calculators to assess patient-specific dosing and monitoring strategies. Next, please. There was a statistically significant increase in score for each category, except for the ability to use valid tools and self-declared confidence for trop based dosing, which I've highlighted in yellow here. As mentioned previously, the ability to use valid tools did have the lowest increase in score between the two surveys. Um, and once these calculators are used more prevalent in daily practice, it is likely that the competency objective score would increase. Um, Self-declared competence using trough-based dosing was ranked an eight out of 10 prior to the program and non-significantly increased to 8.5 out of 10 upon completion of the program. The use of a trough level as a surrogate marker for AUC was supported by the 2009 guidelines and pharmacists have integrated this strategy into their clinical practice setting. The baseline confidence using trough-based dosing was elevated prior to the competency program and despite the confidence score increasing upon completion, the overall change was non-significant and this is because most pharmacists were already confident using trough-based dosing at baseline. There was an overall significant increase in confidence using both strategies and 83% of pharmacists felt they could confidently dose using both strategies upon completion of the module. And I also think it's worth noting that the self-declared confidence using AUC-based dosing strategies had a 64.7% increase in confidence with a ranking score increasing from a 4 out of 10 prior to the program uh, to a 7 out of 10 upon completion of the program. Next, please. This project has led to the creation of a formal training program to standardize vancomycin dosing competency for pharmacists, ultimately creating a clinical competency strategy to provide optimal patient care. Although it may be difficult to generalize knowledge assessment data from a small cohort, it was shown that reinforcing strategies for dosing vancomycin increased pharmacist knowledge and competence. Providing pharmacists with the appropriate resources related to dosing and monitoring vancomycin using AUC-based dosing strategies help increase the pharmacist's knowledge. While patient cases incorporating the use of online pharmacokinetic calculators help increase confidence in utilizing the new strategy. The combination of both of these competency goals led to an overall positive effect on the outlook of clinical skills related to dosing vancomycin. In the long term, by implementing this competency program to all pharmacists at this organization, the goal is to reduce adverse event rates related to dosing and monitoring vancomycin. Once the competency program is available to all pharmacists in this institution, the plan is to pursue a future expansion of this study to analyze the effect of comp the competency program on adverse event rates related to dosing and monitoring vancomycin. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Shelby, for sharing your information. Next, we have Susan. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Chen, and I'm a PGY1 pharmacy resident with Fairview Pharmacy Services. And my research project was on the development and implementation of an ethanol lock therapy protocol to reduce CLABSI in adult home parental nutrition patients. 
Catheter line associated bloodstream infections, abbreviated as CLABSI, are one of the most common complications in parental nutrition patients. These patients are at high risk for reoccurrence due to the nature of their therapy, as well as many of their diagnoses, such as malnutrition or short bowel syndrome, and long term catheter use. Treatment consists of antibiotics, usually systemic, and possible line removal. In patients who do have reoccurrent line infections and are at risk of losing or limited venous access, then antibiotic locks have been used to salvage the line. However, antibiotics don't infiltrate the biofilm and therefore not getting at the root cause then of the infection. Ethanol, on the other hand, does infiltrate the biofilm and does eradicate it. It is also bactericidal and fungicidal. Next slide. For my research project, I had two objectives. The primary objective was to develop an ethanol lock therapy protocol that can be utilized within Fairview Home Infusion. And my second objective was to characterize patients with documented CLABSI who would benefit from ethanol lock therapy. For my methods, I conducted a literature search, a guideline review, as well as put together an ELT team, which consisted of an infectious disease providers, nurses who specialize in central venous access devices, and pharmacists who specialize in nutrition support. To characterize patients with documented CLABSI, I conducted a retrospective chart review of adult TPN patients with CLABSI at, at our institution between January 1st, 2016 to July 13, 2019. For our ELT protocol, patients who are eligible for this therapy would have a CVAD that is compatible with ethanol, and usually this is silicone only, patients with a history of recurrent line infection, or patients who are at risk of losing venous access or limited venous access, or have poor vascular access. Patients also need to have a TPN formulation that allows for a minimum of a two hour dwell time with the ethanol lock, as well as a patient or their caregiver needs to be able to perform ethanol lock therapy procedures within their home as we are treating patients in the home infusion setting. Patients would be ineligible for ethanol lock therapy if they do not meet any of the above criteria, as well as if they do have an allergy to ethanol alcohol or concurrent therapy with metronidazole, disulfiram, or citrate. Next slide. Other key components of our ethanol lock therapy protocol consist of the lock procedure, compounding, as well as the administration and construction. For the lock order, the patient must have a confirmed ethanol compatible CVAD, as well as the frequency and the dwell time must be specified on the order. For the dwell time, a minimum of two hours is required and it can be up to a maximum of 24 hours. For the dose, we are standardizing our dose to be two milliliters, although three milliliters has been used. For the two milliliter dose, we had decided on that based on an extensive review of the central venous access devices and the priming volumes within each of those devices and the ones that we would be using for our patients. For compounding, 98% dehydrated alcohol will be diluted then with sterile water to 70% and drawn up in the two milliliter volume in syringes. The beyond use date for the syringe storage is nine days in the refrigerator. For administration instructions, some key things to note that the line must be flushed with normal saline prior to use, followed by installation of the two milliliters of 70% ethanol solution into the catheter lumen. And after the dwell time, then we will flush the ethanol through the lumen with normal saline. Next slide. For the patient characteristics from the retrospective chart analysis, there were 154 documented collapses that occurred within the time frame, and of those, 52 patients actually met the inclusion criteria. To meet inclusion criteria, patients had to have TPN therapy and have had to have an episode of collapse within January 1st, 2016 to July 13, 2019, and also had to be at least 18 years of age. There are a total of 79 CLABC cases with the patients who met inclusion criteria, and the CVAD types are listed here. 54% of the patients had a PIC, 20% had a CVC tunneled catheter, 26% had an implanted port, and then 48% of our patients had short bowel syndrome, 
and 50% of our patients were receiving care from our Fairview Home Infusion Nursing Agency. Next slide, please. Listed here then are the results for the patients or their CLEPSI outcomes of the TPN patients. As you can see he listed here on the left the, the results of the pathogens that were identified. Majority of the patients had Staph aureus as a pathogen, which is consistent then with the data that is currently available. Other gram positive as well as gram negative and then fungi were also present. 31% of the patients had a polymicrobial CLABSI. 7% had mixed bacteria and fungi. 85% of the patients had their catheter removed following each CLABSI episode. And 8% of the patients actually had their catheter salvaged. 14 of our patients had reoccurrent episodes of CLABSI, and these are our patients that would be eligible then for ethanol lock therapy. And our CLABSI rate, which is defined as a total number of CLABSI infections over total catheter days times 1,000, was 5.1 over this 46-month period. Next. Limitations of this study. So this study was only conducted, conducted at a single center. It also had a small sample size, as only 52 patients did meet our initial inclusion criteria. In addition, it was retrospective, and it does lack a comparator group as we are associated with a large academic medical center, and therefore we may not be able to compare um, to other home infusion organizations, or it'd be hard to generalize to other home infusion organizations. Next slide. For clinical implications, so we are planning then, or we are in the process of standardizing this ethanol lock therapy, and it is standardized at Fairview Home Infusion, however, rolling out that standardization within our whole, our larger academic health system. In addition then, for implementing ELT therapy in those patients that were identified as being high risk and also having reoccurrent line infections. We'll continue to create quality improvement projects as well as continue to work to reduce and prevent then additional collapses or future collapses in our health system. And one way to do that would be to continue to standardize ethanol lock therapy across the system, as well as patient and provider education. For future, future research directions, we'll continue to collect CLABSI data at our organization as well as the next step of the study will be to evaluate the outcomes of patients who receive ethanol lock therapy compared to patients who do not receive ethanol lock therapy in a home infusion setting. And lastly, it will be to collaborate with other home infusion institutions, and with one um, area would be to focus on making sure that we standardize the definition of CLABSI throughout the different home infusion institutions, as well as then be able to collaborate with our standardized therapy protocol um, for these organizations as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that great presentation. A lot of ex great information in that. Next up, we have Diana and Eric. Good afternoon. My name is um, Eric Sigenthaler, and I'm here today with my colleague, Diane Marks. Um, and we are presenting on our project, um, Development of Home Infusion Pharmacist Outpatient Parenteral Antimicrobial Therapy Collaborative Practice Agreement Within a Health System Setting. So a mouthful. Uh, next slide, please. So a little information on our services um, at Freydert. Um, Freydert Home Infusion is a health system-based home infusion provider. Um, we were established in July of 2017. Um, we utilize a shared electronic health record <clears throat> within our health system, um, and over 90% of our referrals come within the Freydert health system. And um, of these referrals, a large majority are antimicrobial therapy. With this, Freighter Home Infusion pharmacists work closely with the infectious disease providers um, and the ID pharmacist who manage the majority of all patients going home on outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy, or OPAT. Um, <clears throat> and with this comes um, shared responsibility and shared work. However, we realize there's a lot of duplication of work and maybe some inefficiencies in the workflow that could be solved through a collaborative practice agreement. Um, so we started working in June of 2019 uh, with the ID clinic team um, to develop our um, collaborative practice agreement, or CPA. Next slide. <clears throat> so a collaborative practice agreement is defined as a legal document that establishes a relationship between a pharmacist 
in a position that allows pharmacists to participate in collaborative drug therapy management. And in the state of Wisconsin where we practice, um, this is codified into law relatively bro broadly, which is really great for pharmacists. Um, and you can see it here, the, the language states, a pharmacist may perform any patient care services delegated to the pharmacist by a physician. Next slide. So um, here we have our, our method. So to uh, <clears throat> first things first, we started out by taking the existing collaborative practice agreement, um, which was in place. So previous to our involvement, um, Recently, prior to June, as well as before Freighter Home Infusion opening in 2017, there is a pharmacist in the infectious disease clinic who is managing all um, OPAT patients plus the additional clinic patients that are seen in the infectious disease clinic. Um, and this was about 80 to 100 patients at a time. Next slide, please. Um, so here we just have, uh, we kind of pulled in our collaborative practice agreement. Um, our organization, our health system uses a general template for collaborative practice, practice agreements for pharmacists. Um, and this has been validated by our organization's compliance department and is approved through the Center for Medication Utilization, which is like our P&T body within the health system. Next slide, please. So the objective of the collaborative practice agreement was to allow <clears throat> pharmacists to manage administration and monitoring of medications within our pre-approved system, antimicrobial guidelines. And ultimately the goals of the CPA are to standardize the monitoring and dosing, um, to increase the safe use of antimicrobials, manage side effects and ADRs associated with OPAT, and reduce, ultimately pr reduce provider workload related to monitoring and the adjustment of antimicrobials. So in regards to workflow, all patients need to be established and under the care of a freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin provider. Um, we manage the patients that are referred to our services and for patients being treated by other home infusion agencies, these are managed by the ID clinic pharmacist. Next slide, please. And then this is just an example of some of the many guidelines for therapy that we're able to follow within the collaborative practice agreement. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So looking at our freighter home infusion specific work, workflow, uh, to initiate the collaborative practice agreement, a referral must be placed. And this ultimately validates the physician engagement and order for entry into the collaborative practice agreement. Um, at the time of admission, the home infusion pharmacist will review the discharge plan provided by the infectious disease prescriber. Um, this includes recommended therapy, labs, um, end date, and how to manage the uh, vascular device. It also includes whether additional follow-up is needed prior to end of therapy. And our, our home infusion pharmacists validate these against our system guidelines shown before uh, for inappropriate orders and are able to up to update these as appropriate. Um, all patients then are put onto a shared electronic health record list that is used both by our team and shared with the infectious disease pharmacist, ID nurses, and the ID providers. Next slide, please. Um, again, on the outpatient side, the referral allows the pharmacist to manage antimicrobial therapy and the labs and adjust as guided in our guidelines. Um, and within the electronic health record, pharmacists manage in that shared list a documentation flow sheet and follow-up date for quick and easy review of information by the clinic staff. And now I'm going to pass it to Diane Marks to go into the next portion of our project. Next slide, please. The next step in our process was to meet with IT to develop an electronic referral order. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Meetings were held with an IT representative to learn about the electronic referral process and how to develop a home infusion pharmacist referral. An electronic referral order already existed for the pharmacist in the infectious disease clinic along with other ambulatory clinics. It was decided to have one ambulatory pharmacy referral order that allowed the provider to choose the department where the patient would be seen by the pharmacist and the reason for the referral. The statement included in the referral, by dropping this referral, you acknowledge that you are using an established system-wide pharmacist collaborative practice agreement and or a clinic-specified established collaborative practice agreement satisfied the legal requirements. One pharmacist attended the complete 
and completed the EHR referral module training as required by the organization. Back one slide, please. Now we started working on how to implement the new process. Majority of our referrals come from two main ID clinics. The first group, which is part of our health system, covers our main campus and is staffed by ID specialty trained clinical pharmacists. The other one, a contracted group without clinical pharmacists, covers our largest community hospital. Meetings were scheduled with providers, pharmacists, nurses, and medical assistants at these clinics. Can you please go forward two slides? Agendas were developed. First, copies of the CPA were provided. It was reviewed along with the updated EHR referral order. The role of the home infusion pharmacist was discussed. Incorporation of a pharmacist into the clinic workflow where there currently was not pharmacist involvement for the one clinic and distinction of roles between the home infusion pharmacist versus the ID specialty trained pharmacist for the other clinic. Communication and documentation were discussed at length. Effective communication was vital to ensure all involved could access up-to-date information at all times. We discussed when providers would like to be paged immediately versus an electronic message for non-urgent matters. All groups have access to the same EHR but with different functionality. <clears throat> Progress notes could be viewed by all involved. Home infusion pharmacists were given access to clinic, pa clinic patient lists located in the EHR. Communication methods and procedures agreed upon. Individual clinic specific workflows discussed and adjusted. Content and layout of progress notes completed by home infusion pharmacists that would be routed to IED providers were developed. Situations where the home infusion pharmacist would abstract patient labs discussed to avoid duplication of work with the medical assistant. The home infusion pharmacist took on this responsibility to expedite entry of pharmacokinetic labs and further patients followed by the contracted providers since their clinic did not abstract labs into the EHR. Clinic protocols and procedures for line occlusions reviewed. It was decided that the home infusion pharmacist would run benefits, benefits for all to place coverage in the patient's home. If covered, <clears throat> Um, an order would be entered in the EHR and routed to the provider for co-signature along with a progress note. If all the place was not covered for administration in the patient's home, the home infusion pharmacist would route the note to the ID clinic to, co to coordinate infusion clinic appointments. Oftentimes, the patient's end of therapy date is before follow-up appointments or imaging can be scheduled. Different scenarios discussed. If appropriate, the home infusion pharmacist would extend um, end of therapy through the follow-up appointment or imaging if within three days of the original end, end of therapy. If longer, an electronic message was sent to the provider along with the clinic nurses to clarify the plan. Some clinical scenarios were reviewed that the home infusion pharmacist often encountered. A couple of examples include when to increase CK monitoring with elevated levels, when to contact a provider with new complaints of muscle pains or elevated CK levels, and statin use with daptomycin. Uh, another, the route of cefepime administration after discharge, as our hospital only uses extended infusion protocols, but for some patients, IV push would be appropriate. We also reviewed vancomycin gold troughs and AUC monitoring and hepatic uh, and renal dosage guidelines. A goal live date was set and appropriate communication was sent out to all clinic personnel involved in the new process. Next slide, please. A meeting was held with the home infusion pharmacist to review the CPA, the ID clinic meeting minutes, and medication guidelines included within the CPA. Progress note templates were updated to satisfy ID clinic requests along with home infusion documentation requirements. Pharmacokinetic protocols were reviewed and pharmacist competency assessed. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The CPA went live on October 1st, 2019. 282 referrals received between October 1st, 2019 through March 31st, 2020. Anecdotal feedback has been very positive from ID clinics, inpatient providers involved with the discharge process, home care nurses, and the home infusion pharmacists. Pharmacists made numerous inventions even outside of the guidelines covered by the CPA. Some of these included uh, management of antibiotic-associated adverse effects, such as thrombocytopenia with ceftriaxone, neutropenia with vancomycin, acute interstitial nephritis with penicillin, neurologic side effects with ertapenem. 
They were also involved with C. diff uh, testing and diagnosis and appropriate pro probiotic use, including avoidance in immunocompromised patients. To obtain more objective data, a survey monkey was distributed to ID providers, pharmacists, and nurses to measure outcomes. Unfortunately, only 10 surveys were completed in total before the COVID-19 pandemic occurred. Seven from physicians, two from clinic pharmacists, and one from a clinic nurse. The entire focus and time of the ID team was shifted to COVID-19. Next slide, please. The first set of questions in the survey served to evaluate the pharmacist's clinical competency to care for patients. The pharmacist scored greater than eight in all categories, range being one to 10, with one the worst and 10 the best. Categories included medication dosing, lab monitoring, coordination of care, and overall management of the patient. Next slide, please. The second set of questions rated the satisfaction with the home infusion pharmacist involvement in the CPA. The pharmacist scored greater than four on a scale of one to five, with one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. The survey responses confirmed an improvement in coordination of care, workflow efficiency, patient safety, and overall quality of care. Next slide, please. Considering one overall goal, the CPA was to improve efficiency along with reducing redundancy and workflows. The third, third set of questions were structured to assess it. Communication was also assessed since, since effective communication was being vital to avoid errors and omissions. The scores were greater than four on a scale with one to five, with one being very dissatisfied and five being very satisfied. We also tried to quantify the amount of time saved per week managing out, outpatient antimicrobial therapy by different providers since init initiation of the CPA. We weren't surprised that the most time saved was for the ID clinic pharmacist since the home infusion pharmacist assumed responsibility for a portion of their patients. The least amount of time saved was for the physician since their workflows were minimally affected. We also asked open-ended questions. One was if there was anything the home, and pharma home infusion pharmacist can approve upon. And we requested other comments regarding the ID OPAT CPA and the home infusion pharmacist involvement. <clears throat> Responses were generally positive, um, such as our pharmacists are the best. Um, my experience has been excellent. I found it to be very helpful, particularly with ongoing dosing adjustments and also provides another avenue for patients to express their concerns. Um, we had a couple um, areas for improvement. Uh, they did notice that some follow-up dates didn't get adjusted in the shared list, but noted this was minor. We have since then monitored this more closely, and it has improved since the pharmacists have become more familiar with the new workflows. Um, we did receive one comment about vancomycin AUC monitoring. This is a generally new concept only um, in use at our main campus so far. So we again went back to review, re-educate on the a AUC dosing protocols, and um, answered any questions the home infusion pharmacist had about them. Next slide, please. All right, so in review, um, the collaborative practice agreement took us about four months uh, from start to implementation. Um, however, this is going to be entirely variable based on your organization structure and um, CPA infrastructure if there is any. Um, it may also vary significantly for those that are not parts of a health system or in a different state due to differing state regulations. Overall, we feel this was a very successful development and implementation of a, a home infusion IDOPAT CPA, especially for us. Um, we will continue to work with the clinic um, to assess the workflows and look for improvement opportunities that Diane mentioned previously. Uh, the survey results showed that a home infusion pharmacist involvement may lead to improvement in patient care, efficiency of workflow, and overall time saving. However, <clears throat> we must be careful not to, um, not to really read into these too much. Um, we feel the survey probably has low validity due to the small number of responders um, and the potential for internal bias since we were producing the survey and providing it to um, our colleagues in infectious disease. Next slide, please. Um, however, I think it's really clear to our team based on this experience that there is a role for home infusion pharmacists to expand roles through things like collaborative practice agreements. I think different home infusion providers can look at what areas we already manage 
um, and realize that as home infusion providers, we are often the experts in these areas, ultimately. Um, <clears throat> most experiences, um, uh, I guess, people involved in these situations, so home infusion patients, require high-touch services, and home infusion pharmacists, again, are experts in these areas. Um, in the future, I guess, what I would say to other home infusion providers and for ourselves are to look to areas where you are managing care um, or where there might be a workflow bottleneck and all involved may benefit from a collaborative practice agreement. For example, right now we are looking to collaborate with our GI clinic colleagues to implement a collaborative practice agreement for managing parenteral nutrition patients in that clinic. And future research is needed to validate our outcomes that we found at Freighter and then look at ways to expand CPA opportunities across all types of home infusion providers and locations across the nation. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Eric and Diana. I know that you're going to get a lot of questions about setting that up. Next, we have Hayden. Hi, everyone. My name is Hayden Smith, and I am the consultant for the Quorum Registry Program. And I will be discussing with you guys the health-related quality of life in patients with primary immunodeficiency and concomitant mental health issues. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give a brief overview of both PIDD and mental health disorders to see the overlap between these two diseases. Primary immunodeficiency, often abbreviated as PIDD, affects approximately 1 in 1,200 people in the United States. Typically, we treat these patients either with intravenous or subcutaneous immunoglobulin therapy. These patients have low circulating levels of different immunoglobulins in their blood, so we end up treating them by putting the immunoglobulin back into their system to kind of raise their immune response so they don't get sick quite as often. And to bring this back to the home infusion world, 42% of intravenous immunoglobulin patients and 93% of subcutaneous patients receive their therapy in the home, either by a, uh, another home infusion provider or a caregiver. And in the case of the subcutaneous patients, they actually do administer themselves. However, mental health disorders such as anxiety and depression are much more common. You're probably much more familiar with this than PIDD, and it affects one in five patients in the United States. So kind of give that in percentages, one in five is 20% of the U.S. population, whereas one in 1,200 is 0.083% of the U.S. population. And treatment for mental health disorders can include psychotherapy, psychotropic medication, and psychosocial treatments. However, these patients are still prone to high-risk behavior, which could lead to other illnesses. One major example is HIV. And other issues include loss of cognitive abilities, particularly during any kind of psychotic episode for these patients. Next slide, please. This really becomes an issue when you look at patients with mental health disorders, um, if they do happen to have any kind of lack, lack in cognitive judgment, because they do have lower medication here and so their psychotropic medication. Depending on which study you're looking at, the rates are anywhere between 50 to 75%, meaning they're taking about half to 75% of the prescribed medication. However, I would like to point out these studies are only in regards to psychotropic medications and don't highlight the adherence to other medications the patient might be taking for other illnesses. If you step into my field, which is studying quality of life in patients, um, some surveys such as the SF36 ask patients to rate their health as a whole, which becomes really difficult if you're trying to use one of these surveys to look at the effects of just one illness, in this case PIDD. And when you look at patients that have both mental health disorders and PIDD, you do see very similar effects on their quality of life. Overall, the quality of life is lower, both in mental and physical aspects. However, you might have a possible increased rate of infection in your PIDD patients if they're still having poor medication adherence to their uh, immunoglobulin therapy, as well as to their psychotropic medication, as well as a possible lack of symptom control due to poor medication adherence. Once again, this highlights kind of both illnesses. So you might have increased infections or get sick more often, but you might also see some of the mental health problems exacerbate due to that poor medication adherence. Next slide, please. So 
So the purpose of this study was to examine the differences in quality of life and medication adherence for PIDD patients that did or did not have concomitant mental health disorders. Next slide, please. So for the study methods, I included all of the PIDD patients from the Immunoglobulin Diagnosis Evaluation and Key Learnings Registry, which is abbreviated as IDEAL. This is a prospective IRB-approved study of patients receiving Ig replacement therapy in the home through one home national infusion company, which would be Corum CVS Specialty Infusion Services. And all data were collected following patient consent. I collected data from the SF36 version two quality of life survey, and I used um, these answers and put them into Optum software to get both the uh, quantitative and qualitative results that I'll show you in a couple slides. I used the history and physicals for each patient to look at their mental health diagnoses. This was used to see what kind of diagnosis they may or may not have in regards to mental health disorders. I then used the medication profiles for the patient to look and see if they had any mental health medications, for example, antidepressants on their medication profile, which is also indicative they may have a mental health disorder. And lastly, I looked at the shipping records for these patients to note their medication adherence. I calculated medication adherence by looking at the number of shipments that we sent and seeing how many of those shipments match the prescriber's orders, both in dosage and in frequency with which these were shipped. Um, so the calculation ended up being the number of correct um, shipments divided by the total number of shipments for the patient. Next slide, please. Of our 412 patients that have PIDD on the IDEAL registry, 11.7% of them had a documented mental health disorder on their history and physical. That's the darker red color you'll see. 30.1% of patients had a mental health medication on their medication profile but did not have a diagnosis on their HNP. And then the remaining gray part, uh, the majority of our patients did not have a mental health disorder. However, I would like to emphasize that if you combine the 11.7 and 30.1% of patients, that's over 40% of our patient population that either had a confirmed mental health disorder diagnosis or had a strong possibility they had a mental health disorder. As I showed you earlier, the national average is 20%. So we had over double the prevalence of the U.S. population in our PI IDD patients that either um, are confirmed to suffer from a mental health diagnosis or they uh, have a strong possibility of having one. Next slide, please. Next, I looked at the quality of life scores from the SF36 version two. So first we divide those scores into both a mental component and a physical component score. They, sound, they are pretty much what they sound like. One looks at mental health quality of life and the other one looks at physical health quality of life. On the mental component score and the physical component score, um, by convention, Optum software normalizes all the answers to 50. If you were looking at the entire US population, you would expect an answer of 50 kind of the average of everyone regardless of illness. You will note that the average of all patients over the 12 months of follow-up does either approach or kind of is at 50, so the entire 12 months of follow-up. However, our patients with a diagnosed mental health disorder are not only below that 50 mark for their mental health quality of life, they're also statistically significantly lower than the average of all the patients on the registry, showing their mental health quality of life is lower than all the average of all the registry patients. I do not show the physical component score, but there was no statistical significant difference, nor any difference at all in their physical health quality of life. If you take the mental component score and then divide it again, you get a couple of different subscores. The main one that I looked at was their mental health subscore. So looking at the effects um, of their illnesses and how they play a role in their mental health. Once again, you'll see that all the patients were above 50, which is great, the average for all of them on the registry, the PIDD patients. However, you will note again, the patients with the mental health disorder have statistically significant lower baseline in 12 months mental health subscores. Next slide. Thanks. Lastly, I wanted to look at the medication adherence for these patients. Once again, that was calculated by dividing the number of correct shipments 
divided by the total number of shipments per each patient. I first want to highlight the patients with a mental health disorder. They had medication adherence of 87.6%. You then look at the patients that had a mental health medication, but, uh, their medication profile, but no diagnosis, and it raises up to 89%. And lastly, the highest medication adherence was for our patients that had no mental health disorder, either on a diagnosis on their HNP nor on their medication profile. I will highlight these differences were not statistically significant, even though the patients with no mental health disorder did have higher medication adherence. I would also like to highlight that 87.6% is still higher than the previously studied adherence to psychotropic medication. This might be related to the benefits of IG therapy, um, kind of trying to prevent some of the infections and the patients might value this medication a little bit more, or they might be reminded um, by another practitioner to take their IG medication more often. Next slide, please. So to wrap everything up, I would like to highlight that patients with concomitant mental health disorders had decreased mental health quality of life compared to patients without and that the prevalence of mental health disorders in our patient population was higher than the national average, over double the national average. Lastly, I would like to mention the importance of increased monitoring of your PIDD patients with mental health disorders. As I showed in the previous slide, they do have lower quality of life than patients with just PIDD alone. This is likely due to the multiple illnesses, um, but this could also be in relation to their lower medication adherence. Perhaps they're having less symptom control on both their mental health diagnosis and on their PID diagnosis. If you follow the patients more closely, providers can ensure that patients are properly managing their illness and thus increase the overall quality of life during treatment for your patients. And that is all. Thank you guys so much for your time today. Thank you so much. Bringing light to something that I think as all providers we see. Um, so thank you for bringing that forward. Mental health is very important for outcomes. Next up, we have Rachel. Rachel. Hello, thank you. My name is Rachel Delavar, and I'm a PGY1 pharmacy resident at Quorum CVS Specialty Infusion Services. And the research which I will be presenting on today is the prescriber acceptance rates of pharmacist recommendations specifically in a home infusion setting. Next slide, please. So first to give a little background, pharmacists are considered to be the final check for medications before they end up in the hands of patients. So before an order can be approved, they first have to make sure that everything is appropriate, including that it's the right patient, the right medication at the correct dose, that it's an appropriate route of administration, that the medication is being used for the right reasons, and if any of these things aren't quite right, it's the responsibility of the pharmacist to either get clarification or make a recommendation for change. In home care, patients often have very specific needs and require whole teams of healthcare professionals that work very closely together to help these patients meet their therapy goals. And so this communication between pharmacist and provider is extremely important. Previously, the outcomes surrounding these recommendations have been studied in um, various areas of pharmacy, including hospital managed care and retail settings. However, studies are still needed to evaluate the outcomes in a home infusion setting. Next slide, please. So the objectives of this study were to determine how often various types of recommendations were either accepted without modification, accepted with modification, or rejected as well as then to evaluate the reasons behind the rejections received and to analyze how long it took to receive responses from the prescribers from the time that the recommendation was made. Next slide, please. So this study was conducted in a home infusion pharmacy which provides services to patients throughout the entire state of Wisconsin, as well as parts of Illinois. And the duration of the study ran from October 22nd, 2019 through January 31st, 2020. And recommendations were included for analysis if they were made by a pharmacist in regards to a therapy being received by a patient on service with them. And those changes were not included if the order stated pharmacy to dose. Additionally, Fisher's exact test was used to evaluate the relationship between the type of recommendation made and the responses received. Next slide, please. And so pharmacists were asked to document the details of each recommendation that they made, as shown on this slide. 
Data collected included when the recommendation was made, any associated medications, the type of recommendation along with a brief description, the time to provide a response, the outcome, and if applicable, the reason for the rejection. Next slide, please. So in total, 51 recommendations were made over the three months that the study was conducted, of which 22 were changes to dose, 10 were changes to drug monitoring, nine were related to starting, stopping, or in some way changing a drug, six were related to administration, and four fell into the category of other, which included things that didn't quite fit into the other categories, such as recommending an increase in bag size so that the patient wouldn't need to change their bag as often, or recommending that the referral source keep the patient in the hospital for an extra day to allow for the first dose to be given in a controlled setting, or other things of that nature. And what we saw was that the majority of the recommendations, 70.6 of them, 70.6% um, of them were accepted without any modification needing to be made at all, whereas 15.7% were accepted with changes made, and then 13.7% were rejected. And ultimately, we found no association between the type of recommendation that was made and the outcomes of the responses that were received, meaning the recommendations did not appear to be more or less likely to be accepted based solely on the category that they fell into. Next slide, please. So the breakdown of therapies for which recommendations were made is shown here. So as you can see in the pie chart, almost a third of all the recommendations that were made were in relation to vancomycin therapy specifically, followed by hydromorphone in second and TPNs in third. Overall, 58.8%, so almost 60% of all the recommendations made were in regards to antibiotic therapies as opposed to non-antibiotic therapies which is a good indication of the types of medications that home infusion patients often receive, and also where there are likely opportunities for pharmacists to become more involved in the patient care process. Next slide, please. For recommendations that were rejected, they could all be grouped into one of these three categories in the table on the left, whether it be that the prescriber had access to additional information that wasn't available to the pharmacist, or that the prescriber was exhibiting extra caution, or that they were simply unable to accommodate the request. So for the ones that were due to the pharmacist not having access to information, the information in question sometimes included institution-specific policies from the prescriber's place of practice, or information about the patient that was not included in the history that was shared with the pharmacy. For example, there was one patient from the study who was prescribed vancomycin via a midline and the pharmacist recommended a PICC line be placed instead due to the acidity of the drug. However, it turned out that this patient was not eligible for a PICC line due to the placement of an intracardiac device that they had. So this information was not made known to the pharmacist prior to them making the recommendation, and therefore it was rejected. Then for the two recommendations that were rejected due to caution, one of them was related to a dose change where the prescriber was concerned for side effects, and the other was related to excess flushing due to concerns for line occlusion. Then lastly, the third category where there was just one um, for rejection due to the inability of the prescriber to accommodate the request, this one was related to time constraints surrounding not being able to draw a lab prior to when the patient was going to discharge. And then looking at time to prescriber response, the vast majority of responses were received within the same day while only eight recommendations received responses the next business day or later. And of the responses received the same day, 38 of them were actually received within one hour of the request, which meant that the clinicians were usually able to have their concerns addressed in a very timely manner, and that the extent of time that the medication shipments were delayed was much shorter. Next slide, please. So overall, this study looked at all recommendations that were made by pharmacists to prescribers, regardless of the level of impact that it would have. And although we did not see an association between the type of recommendation that was made and the response received, we did find that a large majority of the recommendations made to prescribers were accepted without any modification needed. And for the rejections that were received, the most common reason 
for rejection was related to information that was not readily available to the pharmacist. The limitations of this study include the short duration, since the study was um, conducted over a three-month span, which in turn resulted in the study having a relatively small sample size. And also, this study only shows the acceptance rates of just one state. And so it's difficult to say if these findings can be applied to other geographical areas as well. Next slide, please. So to sum up, this study gives some initial insight into the role that pharmacists can have in optimizing patient therapies. But of course, more robust studies are still needed to be able to determine how these findings compare to home infusion pharmacies in other areas. So some opportunities for future research would be to compare the types of recommendations that are made across different pharmacies to see how much variability there is, as well as looking at the impact that shared data systems, such as Epic access can have on the types of recommendations made as well as the outcomes. And lastly, it may be beneficial to look at the outcomes based on level of significance um, on the patient's overall plan of care to see if those with potential to have a bigger impact are more or less likely to be accepted. So this concludes my portion. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Rachel. And then our final presentation today will be from Ashley. Ashley? Thank you so much. My name is Ashley McCracken. I am a second year pharmacy administration leadership resident at Johns Hopkins Home Care Group. And today I'm going to talk to you about a two year project I've been working on during my residency called Adverse Drug Reaction Reporting and Application Practices in Home Based Infusion Services. Next slide. So, adverse drug reactions are prevent. A potentially preventable healthcare burden, and they cost the United States an upwards of $30 billion annually. There has been an increased focus in ADRs by accrediting bodies such as the Joint Commission, CMS, and URAC. And one thing to note that many of us know, infusion-related reactions can be generally complex. It's not just the medication. It can also be the equipment or the rate of the infusion. Next slide. So a little bit of background, um, just to give you context of my project, the National Home Infusion Foundation, or NHIF Data Initiative, was started in 2016, and this was an outcomes task force that wanted to standardize the collection, analysis, and summary of patient outcomes data. So they identified six core data elements, and one of which was adverse drug reaction reporting. So really taking this and um, thinking about how we can apply this, I do want to note three of the metrics that they really highlight in the met, um, in this um, recommendation is severity, intervention, and outcome. Next slide. And then also wanted to introduce the NHI benchmarking group. This was started by Mitra Gavgani, our Vice President of Pharmacy Services in 2014. And this is really an industry collaborative group of different health system affiliated home infusion providers. They um, meet once monthly. They aim to share best practices and foster transparency. And they were really helpful in the first phase of my project. Next slide. So like I said, I had two different phases to my project. Phase one primarily being in my first year and phase two um, being in my second. Phase one was really to see what is going on. Let's assess the current ADR reporting and collection across all the peer institutions we have um, in the through the NHIA network. And phase two was really industry specific within our institution, um, developing a workflow that would standardize the collection at our ambulatory infusion services at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Next slide. So diving into the multi-site industry survey, this was an 11 question survey, um, it, that, which you can see right there on the right hand side of the screen. This was focused on ADR reporting, both um, looking at our internal institution, so Hopkins affiliated and external listserv, utilizing that benchmarking group that I highlighted. Um, once we had the survey there and the results, we set up focus groups through um, individuals that were willing to participate to kind of talk about the data and learn more about what um, is the gaps in um, this type of reporting. Next slide. So looking at the survey demographics, I had 12 participants in this survey, um, two of which were internal or Hopkins affiliated sites and 10 were external sites six health systems, two chain, and two independent infusion providers. 
Next slide. Looking right at the standardization within these sites, all sites, 100%, did report that they had a standard process to report adverse drug reactions at their site. However, only about a third of these sites utilize an electronic health record um, for the documentation of this. Next slide. Diving into the access, um, in different institutions provided different people access to the information reported. Um, many had all staff access where others limited to certain disciplines. If you click. Um, looking at barriers to submission, staff submissions um, was the number one barrier, having people actually um, submit the information with workflow and time also reported by the different sites. Click. And then finally, looking at frequency, primarily quarterly reviewing was predominant, but there was monthly and daily reporting at um, several sites as well. Click. Next slide. So here is the type of metrics that individuals are reporting. So to orient you to this slide, the x-axis are different metrics that institutions would report when they do have an ADR reported, and the y-axis is the percent of institutions that um, utilize that report. So for example, the 100% of sites do report patient demographics, dose, route, description, and intervention, where um, it goes down in regards to the other metrics that they may report outcome, follow-up needed, clinicians involved, preventable versus non-preventable in severity. If you click. So thinking about the NHIF documentation requirements we talked about initially, if you click. Intervention being one of them, 100% of sites are um, utilizing this um, and reporting this metric right now. Click. Outcome being second most, 79%, which is good. And then click. Severity is where we see a large gap in this um, data. Not a lot of institutions are reporting that severity. Click. So in conclusion um, from this survey, really identifying there is a high variation and a lack of standardized collection methods between um, different sites regarding ADR reporting. So really there is a need to define a workflow, including specific metrics to apply to other institutions. Of course, there was limitations in the survey, very small sample size, general biases, as with any survey, and then it is difficult to obtain site and center specific data examples due to some of the sensitivity regarding ADR um, reactions. Next. So going into my phase two, um, phase one was more broad scale, what are we doing? Phase two, diving into institutional specific at Johns Hopkins Medicine. So what I wanted to do was develop a workflow to help standardize the collection across our ambulatory infusion centers. And to orient you to what this looks like, on the screen you can see an organizational structure of Johns Hopkins Medicine and all the different sites that um, are under that um, big um, umbrella. So it, as you can see, the affiliated ambulatory infusion suites here the, in red, you can see what sites have the ambulatory infusion suites. Um, and if you click again, for my pilot, we actually focused on three different sites um, for this standardized workflow with the intention of um, branching out to other sites. So the three sites were at um, three ambulatory infusion suites managed by Johns Hopkins Home Care Group, one of which is shared with Johns Hopkins Community Physicians. Next slide. So what we did is we wanted to design an ADR reporting tool within our electronic health record for ease of use. You click, you can see up on the screen, this is an example of what our form looks like. So this was a smart form um, that we piloted at three of those infusion suites. It required documentation with every medication administration, and there was a discrete data element set in all of the form input. So if people are putting in the information, it pulls discrete data out into a real-time report that individuals can pull at any time. Additionally, um, there was cascading logic. So to ensure our nurses or cl clinical staff don't have to fill out the whole form every time, there's actually an initial question, which you don't see on the screen, that says, did an adverse drug reaction occur during this encounter? If they click yes, this form opens and it populates, and you can see in red it denotes the required documentation 
for that individual. If they click no, they can sign the encounter no problem. Next. So looking at our preliminary results, um, our pilot went live January 14, 2020 through the end of April. We had about 546 encounters at our three infusion suites. Um, and about 5% of those did experience an ADR or they marked it as yes. And digging deeper into those yeses, 100% of those were mild or moderate reactions, which was really exciting to see because traditionally, we don't see a lot of reporting on these mild, moderate reactions, but this is where we really wanna drill down and see how often are these mild and moderate reactions um, occurring. Next slide. So this is just the beginning. We still have a few next steps going, and one including surveying those pilot sites, seeing how things went, seeing how we can improve the workflow, um, finalizing a standard operating procedure that will both um, help the interdisciplinary connection between nursing and pharmacy as we manage these ADRs. Additionally, integrating the workflow into our non-oncology infusion suite, which you saw on that initial um, slide, we're doing it across the health system, so we're all cohesive in this documentation. And then developing a toolkit and streamlining data sharing with the NHI initiative. And this is really important because, next slide. In order to complete a Delphi consensus, you need a lot of big data information. And essentially what this is, is it's a list, we'll be able to statistically um, do a analysis of ADR reactions and potential um, risk, and this can be linked to patient-specific demographics, could be hair color, eye color. Um, once we get enough information about these patients and see where to look, we can use expert panels to look at this, identify what is an actual risk factor. You know, this redhead will actually react with rituxan. We need to pre-medicate her before they even get the um, infusion. So this is really the future. Although th these are the first few steps, this is really the big picture as to why this um, information is important in getting this off the ground. Next slide. I wanna thank my um, committee and thank everybody for listening today. Thank you so much to all of our presenters for sharing the information. Before we get to our Q&A session, I just wanted to invite organizations who are interested in participating in the NHIA resident program to reach out to either myself or Ryan Garst at NHIA. The NHIA residency program includes individual education, feedback, and coaching on the development and implementation of a research study, participating in the annual conference in our new drug and biologic presentations, poster presentations in our exhibit Hall, and of course the ability to be considered for the Outstanding Abstract Achievement Awards. We're currently in the planning stages for a resident program for 2021. Again, please contact Ryan or myself if you or your organization would like to participate. My first question actually is going to go to Suzanne. We have a two-part question for you, Susan. How did you determine to flush the ethanol lock versus withdrawing it or aspirating the solution? Thank you for that question. So in terms of rather than withdrawing it, we decided to just flush it through because patients are going to be at home and having them withdraw the solution then may lead to more complications with their line. And we wanted to avoid that. There have been studies that have been conducted to have patients flush it. And based on that information that we have collected, then it would be safe for the patients to flush that minimal amount then through their line. Great, thank you. And then the other part on that was the, did the new FDA approved ethanol product and associated change in price impact the criteria that you use for ethanol locks? That was something that was considered, but it did not make an impact then on our protocol specifically and the use for it as the benefit for using ethanol locks does outweigh that cost factor. Great, thank you very much. My next question, uh, is for Hayden. Did you find it interesting that in the registry, over 30% of patients had mental health medication on board with no diagnosis? Any insight as to why that would happen? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I did find it interesting, and I think the main reason is just probably a limitation of the uh, amount of documents I have access to. Sometimes when we get history and physicals, they're very specific to the illness that we're treating the patient for, and they'll say things about their um, infection rates or maybe some viruses the patients have come in contact with as a result of their immunodeficiency. Um, but when they look at the medication profile, it's usually a little bit more broad in terms of all the medications the patient takes. So I think it was probably just that they weren't there. Um, that's why I said that I was fairly confident those patients probably do have a mental health diagnosis, even though I couldn't find it on their history and physical. Thanks a lot, Hayden. Appreciate that insight. Rachel, specifically with the hydromorphone, can you comment on the type of recommendations that were made since pain management is seen, but not a high volume therapy today for many home infusion providers? Sure. Yeah, the majority of the, of the recommendations that were made in relation to hydromorphone were primarily dose adjustments where the patient was complaining of breakthrough pain despite their current regimen. And so then recommendations, recommendations would be made to the provider to increase dose a specific amount. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is for Shelby. Uh, who developed the education program you used in your study? Uh, thank you for the question. I actually developed the presentation portion and both the pre and post competency surveys. Um, and so I developed a uh, patient case to use in both of those and um, I guess developed questions to go along with that. Thank you. Let's see here. All right. Um, Shelby, with assessing appropriateness competency, there was a significant increase between pre-test and post-test scores. What factor of the competency program do you feel was the reason for this large increase? I think that it was just due to the education on the appropriateness for using AUC. I think that it's not common knowledge yet that you can only use AUC-based dosing for staph aureus infections and more specifically severe, so like osteomyelitis um, infections. So I think that giving that education and assessing it in the pre and post competency program surveys um, that was what caused the significantly large increase in the score. Thank you. Our next question is for Diane and Eric. Uh, you mentioned that there has been a decreased uh, participation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you provide any insight as to why that might be, especially since the home setting has been getting more attention of late with COVID? Yeah, good question. Thanks. I think our issue, uh, the struggle that we had with the timing of our survey was right as COVID was ramping up and our infectious disease uh, provider partners uh, were really ingrained in our guideline development and preparing for any surge capacity within the system. So, um, you know, as much as we wanted more more survey responses, I think we, we wanted to be careful and respect that they were super busy um, putting together, you know, guidelines and stuff like that with little data. So, we, we took our 10, 10 survey results and, and kind of um, processed what we had. Great, thank you. Uh, we're just gonna take a couple more questions uh, while our judges finish up, um, and then we'll shortly have the winner um, of our Outstanding Abstract Achievement Award. Ashley, in working with providers outside of Johns Hopkins, what was the mechanism of reaching out and selection process for the site participation? That's a great question. So I primarily utilized our um, NHI benchmarking group, which has several different institutions, health system related institutions um, for the communication and reaching out of that. Additionally, um, the preliminary um, phases of this project were during the NHI annual conference last year. So I was able to bring a preliminary poster there present to individuals there and then also get them to take the survey right on the spot. Um, so I think that was what helped me kind of reach out outside of the benchmarking group as well. Great, thank you. Um, and then this question is for uh, Eric and Diane again. Uh, were there any assessment programs developed to determine competency uh, for the practice practicing under the agreement? 
good question. I, uh, right now, at this time, we, we re-reviewed um, the guidelines, but we did not have a competency in place. Um, but we are working with our inpatient um, pharmacy team to integrate um, a competency for that, specifically like I think the other presenter did on AUC. Um, we also, the ID clinic pharmacist at our main campus, we're reviewing any um, um, outside of range pharmacokinetic levels, and then uh, we did review that with them to see if it's something we could have um, done better, or if it was just uh, what happens sometimes with those patients. Thank you. Uh, Shelby. Was there consideration or did you look at adverse event rates prior to and after the training to validate the training? We initially were planning on analyzing adverse event rates prior to the program and after completion. However, um, due to the short amount of time that we have to complete the project, um, we did not have enough time to evaluate adverse events. And so we do plan to um, roll the program out to the entire enterprise and then look at adverse event rates um, in a year um, after completion. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Hayden. Um, how might you see the data that you gathered in your study be applied in the field of home infusion? I think the best way to apply it would be looking at the patient as a whole whenever you make decisions about how to treat them or how closely to follow them and looking for things that might um, cause different uh, medication adherence or maybe a lack of symptom control with these patients and then just monitoring them based on some of the other illnesses you have as opposed to just looking at the one illness you're treating. Great, thank you very much. And we're gonna take one last final question uh, before we announce the winner. If your question did not get asked, we, are, we will connect you with the resident or poster um, author so that we can get those questions asked. Uh, the last question is for Ashley. The majority of ADRs were mild. Can you comment on the types seen? Definitely. That's something that we're still diving into. Um, it was primarily due to certain drug therapies, um, Ocrevus being one just off the top of my head, um, natalizumab. So the, a lot of those reactions were common um, types of reactions you would um, guess that you may see with those types of therapies. Um, what's exciting about that is, you know, diving into those and seeing what types of potential patient-specific demographics can we link to those and potentially um, be able to predict those types of reactions before even um, infusing the therapy. Great. I, I just want to thank again everybody who participated today. Uh, this is tremendous research in the home infusion and specialty arena. Uh, we need more of it and um, we really thank the finalists for their time and knowledge uh, with our industry. So with that, um, I just wanted to remind everybody we did get a bunch of questions. Um, the, this is recorded and uh, a recording, a link to the recording will be emailed to you in the next hour or so. Um, in that email is also the link for the CE. If you uh, follow that link, um, then answer a few questions. You'll be, uh, you'll get one hour of CE for the program. Um, and the presentations are also available for download in the handout section of this um, and will also be on the NHIA website. Uh, NHIF website uh, within the next couple of days. All right, so here we go. So this year we've decided to also award an honorable mention, um, which this year goes to Janet Sluggett, our Down Under submission. Congratulations to Janet, your poster was fantastic. And now the winner of this year's Outstanding Abstract Achievement Award, drum roll please, it's the poster Prescriber acceptance rates for pharmacist recommendation in a home infusion setting by Rachel. Congratulations, Rachel. Yay. You'll receive a $1,000 scholarship, free registration to our 2021 conference in Austin, Texas, as well as have your manuscript published in an upcoming issue of Infusion. On behalf of the NHIF and our judges, we would like to thank all of you for your contribution and research to our industry. Thank you for everyone who attended and have a great day. Congratulations, Rachel.